Hello and welcome to our listeners across the world. I hope you're well, staying strong and fighting back. This is a Worker Solidarity Movement podcast. Free thinking for free people. Today we're thinking about voting, elections and party politics. The WSM is an anarchist organisation active on the island of Ireland. If you live on the island of Ireland and want to work with us or just stay up to date, register as an email contact at www.wsm.ie forward slash user forward slash register. This is a reading of a pamphlet called Parliament or Democracy written by Kevin Doyle. It was written in the 1990s, but unfortunately it's just as relevant today. On a personal note, it was this pamphlet which really put the final nail in the coffin of electoralism for me. It's a brilliant pamphlet, well researched, well argued, well worth a listen. There are quite a few diagrams and charts in the pamphlet, so you might want to have the text version in front of you. You can read it or download the PDF by visiting the WSM website, find the link in the description below. But you should be fine just listening. So with that out of the way, let's get stuck in. From the 1850s onwards, against a backdrop of great new wealth in society and a working class that was more independent and resourceful, the problem of democracy became urgent for the rich and powerful. In general, wealth was rising throughout society, but so was the greed of those who owned the new factories, mines and plantations. The key question was, what was to be done about the general demand for democracy and about the incessant clamour for political rights which during the revolutions of 1848, had almost completely gotten out of hand. Maintaining their privilege and wealth, while generally conceding a semblance of democracy, was the principal aim of the rich and privileged during the second half of the 19th century. Parliament is a means of diffusing democracy, of channeling real struggles into a safe dead end. Time and time again, it has become a graveyard for the workers' movement. The Problem of Democracy The French Revolution of 1789 put an end to the idea that some people were born to rule. In only a short number of years, one of the oldest and most powerful monarchies in Europe was swept away. In its place came the idea of legal equality and individual rights as set out in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. The basis of these new rights, established on foot of a great social upheaval, was the real hallmark of the French Revolution since it was accepted, from that point on, that laws and how they were made were the expression of the general will. As such, these laws could be made and unmade as that general will was discerned. That was the real break with the past. At the time of the French Revolution, the idea of the general will was still new in politics. Even so, the implications for the future were not difficult to make out. Sixty years earlier, in England, during the Civil War, the very same issues had come to the fore. If the monarchy was to be dispensed with, what type of society should replace it? What exactly constituted the general will? And as importantly, in whose service was its rule to be applied? During the Putney debates, the anti-royalist forces who had fought to depose Charles II argued over these very issues. The principal leaders of the anti-royalist movement, men such as Oliver Cromwell and others, were definite that the king's arbitrary rule should end. But equally, they were clear that the running of society should not be left to just anyone. The king's right of power had rested on his birthright. Now that this was gone, a new form of distinction was needed. They argued, lest the rule of society fall into the hands of the common people. That new distinction was to be property. As Cromwell's general, Henry Ireton, put it, I think that no person hath a right to an interest or share in disposing of the affairs of the kingdom that have not a permanent fixed interest in the kingdom. But this view was not shared by others who had also fought the king. The Civil War had thrown up many groupings. Some, such as the Levellers, were conscious of the social conditions of the day. Others still, the Diggers, had seized unworked land and declared it their own by virtue of the plants they had put on it and the labour they had expended. Such groupings were profoundly stirred by the struggle against the autocrat Charles II, 
They were anti-authoritarian and viewed matters differently from the likes of Cromwell. The well-known leveller, Thomas Rainsborough, countered Ireton with, I think that the poorest in England hath a life to live as the greatest, and therefore every man that is to live under a government ought first by his own consent to put himself under that government. But this idea that everyone, irrespective of individual wealth, was entitled to a say in the running of society had dangerous implications. Implications that directly threatened the interests of the men of property and the rich. Ireton again. By the same right of nature by which you say a man hath an equal with another of the choosing of him that govern him, by the same right of nature he hath the same right in any goods he sees. The central matter being goods. English society in the era of the Civil War was a much poorer society than it is today, but relative to the population of the time, there was still an abundance of wealth. That wealth was not shared equally. There was a massive disparity in who owned what, a major source of grievances, as the digger Winston Lee noted. And this is the bondage that the poor complain of that they are kept poor by their brethren in a land where there is so much plenty for everyone. So, in the English Civil War, the abolition of the rule of the king had raised almost immediately a more intractable problem. If full equality was conceded, wouldn't the privilege of the rich be brought to an end? After all, it was Aristotle, thousands of years earlier, who had pointed out the most glaring fact, quote, The rich are few and the poor are many. In any straightforward count, or referendum, the interests of the rich would be swamped alongside the priorities of the more numerous poor. So was born the, quote, problem of democracy. The immediate solution employed by the rich during the English Civil War was, of course, force of arms. This was the fate suffered by Democrats such as the diggers and the levellers, both of which were dispersed using military means. It was propertied men such as Cromwell and Ireton who benefited most. They ruled through a new parliament and had greatly increased power while the poor suffered on. As an observer noted in his journey across England in 1660, the island is governed by the influence of the sort of people that live plentifully and at ease upon their rents extracted from the toil of their tenants and servants, each of whom within the bounds of his own estate acts the prince. He is purely absolute. His servants and labourers are in the nature of his vassals. His tenants indeed are free, but in the nature of subjects. Like the English Civil War, the French Revolution would have a limited effect on how society was organised in the short term. Though the French monarchy was fatally weakened and the rule of law was established, the real beneficiaries were the emerging bourgeoisie. These, the merchants and bankers of France, had been one of the motive forces in the fight against the monarchy. They had provided the ideas and reasoning for the revolution. For too long, they had suffered unjust taxes, levied on them by a corrupt king. In the aftermath of the French Revolution, with their hands on the reins of power, they remade the laws in their own interest to benefit trade and those who traded. But the French Revolution was also crucially different, in a way that would have important overall consequences. Firstly, it, quote, was alone of all revolutions which preceded and followed it a mass social revolution. The masses themselves had been one of the prime forces in its success. At crucial periods in the struggle for power, they had, by their very presence, pushed events forward. This had struck a chord with the downtrodden everywhere, but it also taught a crucial lesson. Where a form from above proved fruitless, revolution from below could work. In part, as a reflection of this, political consciousness rose across Europe. The French Revolution was particularly important for a second reason. It occurred as the very early stages of the Industrial Revolution were getting underway. Overall, wealth in society was increasing. In France and England, it is estimated that society's wealth doubled in the 18th century. But in the next 50 years, as machinery and labour were harnessed, the rate of increase in wealth accelerated rapidly. Beginning first in England, 
where conditions were most favourable, industrialisation spread relatively quickly to the continent of Europe. By the 1840s, quote, The actual industrial transformation of the non-English speaking world was still modest, a little more than 100 miles of railway line in the whole of Spain, Portugal, Scandinavia, Switzerland and the entire Balkan Peninsula, end quote. But even so, quote, the actual rise in production and exports were gigantic. This is a note from the narrator. If you want to see from which sources those quotes are coming, then you can find them in the text version, uh, a link to which is in the description. What this meant for the rich and privileged was a vast increase in their wealth. How vast is often not appreciated. The historian Eric Hobsbawm gives one indication with his explanation for the dramatic rise in railway construction that occurred at this time in Britain. In just 20 years, railway construction there jumped from just a few dozen miles of line in the 1820s to 4,500 miles of line by 1840 to 23,550 miles by 1850. Where, he asks, did the money come from for such endeavours? His answer is instructive. Quote, the fundamental fact about Britain in the first few generations of the Industrial Revolution was that the comfortable and rich classes accumulated income so fast and in such quantities as to exceed all available possibilities of spending and investment. End quote. Hence the, quote, speculative frenzies concentrating on railway stock investment which hit England in 1835-37 to and again in 1844-47, to known with hindsight as railway mania. Yet this enviable predicament contrasted sharply with the lot of the multitude whose role it was to labour for such enterprises. For them, quote, the transition to the new economy created misery and discontent, end quote. Those without property, those who, in effect, became known as the proletariat, didn't immediately take to the new order. Quote, Labour had to learn to work in a manner suited to industry. It also had to learn to be responsive to monetary incentive. End quote. The early generations of workers didn't find this easy, nor did they like it. There was considerable resistance. The solution, notes Hobsbawm, quote, was found in a draconian labour discipline, but above all in a practice where possible of paying labour so little that it would have to work steadily all through the week in order to make a minimum income, end quote, that it could survive on. This often required the whole family to work. Between 1834 and 1839, in the English cotton mills, of all workers, quote, one quarter were adult men, one half women and girls, and the balance boys below the age of 18. End quote. In the 1840s, in Western Europe, quote, the characteristic social problems of industrialization, the horrors of breakneck urbanization, were commonplace of serious dimensions. Small wonder then that Europe was convulsed by revolution in 1848 whilst liberals in Italy, France, Hungary and Germany pressed forward against the continuing power of royalty in their own countries, independent demands of a serious nature emerged from, quote, workers in Paris and other European cities, raising the cry for social revolution for the Red Republic. Their demands challenged both property and the laws of the market. A suitable solution. From the 1850s onwards, against a backdrop of great new wealth in society and a working class that was more independent and resourceful, the problem of democracy became urgent. In general, wealth was rising throughout society, but so was the greed of those who owned the new factories, mines and plantations. The key question was, what was to be done about the general demand for democracy and about the incessant clamour for political rights which, during the revolutions of 1848, had almost got completely out of hand. This matter weighed heavily on the minds of the rich and privileged during this era. Two main positions emerged. On the one hand, there were people such as Thomas Babington Macaulay, who believed that, quote, 
the higher and middling orders are the natural representatives of the human race, end quote. He was concerned about the issue of enfranchising the poor and propertyless. This issue had already come to the fore in Britain with the rise of the Chartist movement in the 1830s. One of the leading Chartists, Cobbett, had made the important point that the people wanted to vote, quote, that it might do some good, that it might better our situation, and not for the gratification of any abstract whim. Macaulay attacked the idea of universal suffrage in this context. He argued it would lead to, quote, the rich being pillaged, which in turn would lead to the destruction of civilization and a reversion to barbarism, end quote. Others were not so obtuse. J.S. Mill, the well-known 19th century liberal philosopher, was among these. He was well aware that times had changed. He noted that the age had passed, quote, when the uninstructed have faith in the instructed, end quote, with the result that, quote, the multitude are without a guide and society is exposed to all the errors and dangers, end quote. One of these dangers was social revolution. Mill was well aware that something had to be done, but also that the clock could not go backwards. Not that he was under any illusions. Quote, We dreaded the ignorance and especially the selfishness and brutality of the mass. End quote. The lower orders were, in his eyes, quote, the mass of brutish ignorance, the common herd, or the uncultivated herd. In contrast, he saw himself and his ilk as, quote, an endowed class, for the cultivation of learning and for diffusing its results among the community, end quote. The role of such a class was clear, he said, quote, no government by a democracy could rise above a mediocrity except by the counsel and influence of a more highly instructed one or few, end quote. The alternative, a meaningful say for the common herd, was inconceivable, quote, it is not useful but hurtful that the constitution of the country should declare ignorance to be entitled to as much political power as knowledge. A suitable solution then, in Mill's view, was this. Quote, the intellectual classes should lead the government and the government should lead the stupid classes. End quote. What would, in time, become the modus operandi of parliamentary democracy everywhere was not in the 1850s immediately practicable. The natural disadvantage suffered by the middling and higher orders alongside the brutish multitude when it came to the numbers game, the rich are few and the poor are many, was only part of the problem. More pressing was the different expectations that both sides, rich and poor, brought to the particular subject of suffrage and its extension. Mill once again was clear in this regard. Democracy was, quote, not that the people govern themselves, but that they have the security for good government, end quote. Such good government already existed in his eyes. This was Parliament. Hobsbawm notes the state of play in Europe in the middle of the 19th century. The, quote, parliamentary tradition had been established in virtually all European countries, with the exception of Russia. In most cases, however, the power of the traditional elite remained secure if not unchallenged, for parliaments had only nominal power against the executive, and hence were at best weak influences on state policy. End quote. These bald facts about parliament and its irrelevance were widely known at the time. Those who attended the various parliaments of Europe were, for the most part, the appointees of the ruling elites throughout Europe, the various sons of the landed classes and of businessmen lawyers and the other professions. This was hardly the democracy that the stupid classes had in mind. On the contrary, the perception was widespread that rule by the people must mean just that. Hence the dangerous connotations that the word democracy had throughout this period of history. Mill and others were very much aware of this difference of understanding between rich and the poor. It was a major problem. There was not, in a sense, a tradition of governance, or, as it was also put, quote, common ground between the rulers and the ruled, end quote, in which both sides knew their place and lot. Naturally, until such traditions were established, the vote would either have to be withheld or manipulated into ineffectiveness. <laughs>
the qualified vote was the means by which this was done. Though not before another idea, the weighted vote, had been toyed with. This idea, also developed by, by Mill, was nothing if not novel. If every ordinary unskilled labourer had one vote, a skilled labourer ought to have two, a foreman whose occupation requires something more of a general culture and some moral as well as intellectual qualities, should perhaps have three. A farmer, manufacturer or trader should have three or four. A member of any profession requiring systematic mental culture ought to have five or six. A graduate of any university, at least as many. In this way, the numerical disadvantage of the rich could be mitigated until such time as the poor had accepted their lot. But it was not to be. The qualified vote was far more practical, using any arbitrary difference, educational level, possession of property, religion, race, skin colour, sex, age. Access to the vote was curtailed, until such time as people showed appropriate maturity. Gladstone, the British Prime Minister, spelled out what maturity entailed during a debate in 1864 on whether the franchise should be extended from 4% to 8% of the population. The voter, Gladstone said, should be a person with, quote, self-command, self-control, respect for order, patience under suffering, confidence in the law, and regard for superiors. Britain, granting the vote. Between 1850 and 1950, then, a period of 100 years, the main modern parliamentary democracies emerged in Western Europe, North America, Australia and New Zealand. The situation in these countries changed from one in which Parliament, or the Legislature as it was also known, was elected by only 1-5% to of the adult population, to one in which almost 100% were involved. This slow pace reflected the overall problems associated with the building of traditions of governance between the rulers, the rich and privileged, and the ruled, the labouring classes. Given both the social problems of the era and the continuing massive inequality. It was however, though slow, a broadly successful process relying on two important developments apart from the usual method, repression, for success. These were, one, the emergence of a compliant parliamentary socialist movement, and two, the growth and influence of the mass media, which from early days was attendant to the interests and agenda of the rich and privileged. The role of the state. Maintaining their privilege and wealth while generally conceding a semblance of democracy was the principal aim of the rich and privileged during the second half of the 19th century. But patience with this was thin on the ground, especially amongst the multitude who were, as always, quote, truculent and overly concerned with who got what. This impatience broke out in full force in France once again with the famous events of the Paris Commune, 1871, which, even by today's standard, remain a benchmark in the achievement of democratic practice. The Commune, though short-lived, broke with the past in a number of obvious and direct ways that met with the popular mood of revolution. Quote, Those elected to represent the people were to act as delegates, not as parliamentary members. Those elected were subject to recall by the people, and it was the duty of those elected to report back and remain in constant contact with the sources of popular sovereignty. End quote. This was like nothing else that existed in the world at that time. Quote, the police was at once stripped of its political attributes. So were the officials of all other branches of the administration. From the members of the commune down, the public service had to be done at a workman's wages. End quote. This was a system of administration that led the commune to institute or attempt to institute reforms of a very radical nature. Worker cooperatives were formed. Plans were drawn up for workers' control of industry. Special attention was paid to the provision of basic education for all, to improve the position of women and to provide creche facilities for workers near their place of work. 
for the time it was an enormous achievement. But if the commune highlighted anything, generally speaking as an example of democracy, it was vilified by the rich and privileged, it was that the real threat in society to the continuance of privileged no longer emanated from the general masses, but rather from that more specific quantity, the working class. How to deal with this entity was further complicated by the still small but growing influence of anarchist and socialist ideas in its ranks, an influence that was clearly evident in the events of the Commune. Repression, the immediate solution to the Commune, approximately 25,000 Parisians were slaughtered, would not do in the longer term, especially given, even in this period, the evident capacity of workers to articulate and defend their own interests. Indeed, this was perceived to be the real danger of the emerging working class, its independence and autonomy, which set it apart from all other producing classes in society heretofore, most notably the peasantry. For the rich and privileged, then, containing this newfound independence of workers, and if possible, dispersing it, would be crucial aims in the general struggle against democracy. Unless this was done, a society more technologically based than ever before would in time become dangerously vulnerable to its most important of constituents, its workers. Even in the late 19th century, the direction of economic development was pointing to this worst of scenarios, where, irrespective of the interests of the rich, workers might be powerful enough to implement democracy anyway. What was confirming a still small but growing number of workers in such dangerous delusions was the very process of industrial struggle itself which became an important feature as the 19th century continued and on into the 20th. In confronting the owners of industry, workers had, right from the beginning, very little to rely on. Against the brute force and superior material resources of the wealthy, workers had only organisation and solidarity to hold them together. This they used to full effect. By forming themselves into unions and syndicates, organisations that were built systematically throughout this period, workers were able to use their industrial power to full effect. But there was, most importantly, an added bonus. Unions and syndicates were in their own right schools of democracy and political learning. Not only did workers become politicised by getting involved, but also by being part of a union, workers were given valuable lessons in democratic administration. As if this was not bad enough, it was through such involvement that workers were, when successful, confirmed in that most dangerous of ideas, that by their own efforts and organisation they could alleviate their exploitation. An idea which, if left unchecked, could be the basis for far more substantial undertakings. Industrial struggle then was a crucial means by which revolutionary consciousness was developing among the working class. The practical political experience being gained there was also influencing the wider struggle for democratic reform. In a similar way, the wider struggle for democracy was also influencing the demands in the workplace, a feature that was clearly evident in the proposal put forward by co-workers in the Rhondda Valley of Wales in 1912. Our only concern is to see to it that those who create the value receive it. Today the shareholders own and rule the coal fields, they own and rule them mainly through paid officials. The men of the mines are surely as competent to elect these as shareholders who may never have seen a colliery. To have a vote in determining who shall be your fireman, manager, inspector, etc. is to have a vote in determining the conditions which rule your working life. On that vote will depend in a large measure your safety of life and limb, of your freedom from repression by petty bosses, and will give you an intelligent interest in and control over your conditions of work. Such ideas were indeed dangerous. The notion that democracy should be a part of work and the workplace, as much as it should be part of any other aspect of life, directly challenged the rule of the boss. Particularly so when married to notions of industrial strength and union solidarity which were developing at this time. In this context, it was crucial for the rich and privileged to divert the political aspirations of workers away from the industrial arena and towards some more benign institution. Parliament was custom-built for this job. Alone on the left, anarchists signalled the danger which the lure of the Parliament would in time become. On the one hand, there was the crucial question. What could Parliament actually achieve or change given that it had only nominal powers. 
what would be the point in gaining control of it if this control could affect little real change? Though these questions were very important, they were accompanied by a more general debate about the nature of democracy and the role of the state. The real division of the day was between two views. Between that which saw the state as a beneficial agent in society, and that, held by anarchists and some Marxists, which saw it, on the contrary, as an impediment to social and economic progress of any substantial kind. The burgeoning social reform movement of the era, which in time would be dominated by the various labour and socialist parties of the world, was the principal advocate of the idea that the state could be used to benefit workers and the disenfranchised generally. La Salle, the founding father of the German Social Democratic Party, GSDP, held that social improvement of any substantial kind could only come about from state intervention. This was the great prize to be had if workers and their representatives played the game of parliament. Towards this end, La Salle urged the German workers, quote, to look neither to the left nor to the right and to be deaf to everything except universal franchise and the secret ballot. End quote. La Salle was no exception in holding this view. In Britain, the Fabians, a formative force in the Labour Party, had a similar outlook, believing that, quote, the state was fundamentally neutral. It could be used to hinder progress or to further the evolution of humanity towards its collectivist goals. The problem was merely which class was in control of its function, end quote. As they saw it, quote, the state machine of army police and law courts will continue to be used against the people by the rich classes until it is used by the people against the rich classes, end quote. The anarchist view, however, was quite different and, as time would tell, more realistic. As the anarchist pointed out, the state, in essence, was a chain of command. Democratic practices animated none of its many segments and sections. The parliament, moreover, was but a minor part of any government. And the government was but a minor part of the much wider body that also included the army, the police and judiciary, all of which were authoritarian in terms of structure and ethos. How could such bodies be used to benefit society at large? The argument put by La Salle and others was that if a more enlightened or compassionate leadership took the helm, more beneficial ends could be achieved. But the anarchist view rejected this, not because they doubted either the compassion or enlightenment of La Salle, though it was questionable, but because, as they argued, authoritarian institutions could not be used to bring about democratic objectives, i.e. policies that would lead to wealth distribution, the key issue, could not be brought about by a minority, no matter how well-intentioned. Rather, the active and democratic involvement of all society was required to achieve such an end. For anarchists, then, the views and beliefs of reformers were not decisive. What would determine the outcome was the political structures used to bring about the change. For anarchists, the state was not neutral. It was authoritarian and undemocratic, as befitted its purpose. La Salle, as the anarchists saw it, would not change the direction of government or the state if he was elected. Rather, it would change him. He would become authoritarian and self-serving, as befitted the institution he was being empowered to run. Time would tell who was right. A light on the hill. Meanwhile, the real problems remained. The crucial issue for the rich and privileged was how to concede a semblance of democracy while keeping the mass of people as far removed from the levers of power as was practically possible. In this way, the business of making money could be got on with, while the demands for a meaningful democracy were diverted in a cul-de-sac. Parliament, as stated above, was the method of choice. It had nominal powers and concerned itself with the mundane. The real issues in society, the accumulation of wealth by a few, the massive exploitation of labour, the draconian rule of the boss in the workplace, hardly graced its doorstep. Therein lay its beauty, but therein also lay its weakness. The gap between the institutions of power, the state and government, and the huge numbers of people living in poverty was massive in the last half of the 19th century and early 20th. The prestige of parliament was low. As an institution, it was viewed with suspicion and as a plaything for the rich. How, it was asked, could such an institution bring about fundamental reform, or for that matter, a major distribution of wealth? 
Throughout the period, this was an important limitation in most countries. In order to channel the broader demands for democracy and political rights in a safer direction, it was necessary in the first place to build up the perception that Parliament was democracy in action. Similarly, while suffrage was gradually conceded, it was done so in a reluctant and strategic way. Extensions of voting rights were met with expressions of grave concern for the future of society. In turn, the stupid classes, women or black people, anyone whose turn it was, were chastised with, were they capable of understanding political issues? Could they be objective? Would it mean the end of society as it was then known? These questions were debated intensely during the era of reform, 1850 to 1950, that culminated in the establishment of the main modern parliamentary democracies. But from the very beginning, as a general process, reform proceeded furthest and with the greatest speed in the countries of the so-called New World. These states, the USA, Canada, New Zealand and Australia, extended the popular franchise quickly, in part because of their special circumstances. Being countries that were built up on the theft of land from their indigenous peoples, they commanded greater loyalty from their usually white citizenry than was possible in Europe itself. A loyalty that was, in effect, a further safeguard to the economic interests of the rich and privileged. The general process of extending suffrage to the masses was perceived to be dangerous, and so it was. For this very reason, it could not have proceeded successfully without substantial participation from below. This participation was provided by the emerging parliamentary socialist movement, which, from early days, had a view of social change and reform not radically different from that which was tolerable to the rich and privileged. There were two important and essential components to this. Firstly, as was mentioned above, the parliamentary socialists saw the state and its role as all-important. Leaving aside the objections of the anarchists and some Marxists, they viewed the state with a degree of respect that bordered on awe. In many respects, the parliamentary socialists were more attached to the idea of the state than the very capitalists who had relied upon it, time and time again, as a means of repression. They saw control of the state and its chain of command as all-important and a desirable goal in its own right. Secondly, however, there was the question of the multitude and what role they should have in any future society. Were they to be participants, citizens who are active in bringing about change, or were they to be simply people who are called upon to vote every few years, with little other input? Which was it to be? Active and participatory, or passive and in the background? Here the views of the rich and privileged, and the parliamentary socialists also coincided. At one level there was disdain. Beatrice Webb, a member of the Fabians and a founding member of the British Labour Party, quote, was horrified at the immorality and mental dullness of the lower orders. At the turn of the century, she noted, To us, public affairs seem gloomy, the middle classes are materialistic, and the working class is stupid, and in large sections, sottish, with no interest except in racing odds. At another level, however, there was doubt about the political capacity of the working class. The Fabians in general were influential in, fa in the founding of the British Labour Party, but they could not imagine workers originating political ideas of their own. Quote, the utmost function that can be allotted to a mass meeting of workers in a democracy is the ratification or rejection of a policy already prepared for it. End quote. A view that was also held by Edward Bernstein, a key figure in the GSPD. And also, interestingly, by the Russian revolutionary Lenin who had noted the workers were only capable of, quote, trade union consciousness. Nevertheless, the growth of the parliamentary socialist movement in the latter part of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th was meteoric. Across Europe, in South America and in Australia, socialist parties were formed with the expressed aim of taking power. Nowhere was the growth more impressive than in Germany. The GSPD, Quote, increased its vote from 125,000 in 1871 to 1.4 million in 1890, 20% of the total vote, and to 4.2 million in 1912, 35% of the total vote. Similar dramatic increases in the socialist vote occurred elsewhere. Social Democrats obtained 37% of the vote in Finland in 1907, 40% in, Aust in Austria 
in 1919, 30% in Belgium in 1925, and 46% in Denmark by 1935. End quote. In 1910, the first elected socialist government in the world came to power in Australia. These results were indeed dramatic, an indication, no doubt, of the desire in this period for real and substantial change, or wealth distribution. It seemed as if great things were in the offing, a view enthusiastically voiced by Frederick Engels in 1895. Engels, co-author with Marx of the Communist Manifesto, could only marvel at the growth of the German SPD. He seemed to believe that all things would fall before the emerging giant of parliamentary socialism. Quote, its growth proceeds as spontaneously, as steadily, as irrepressibly, and at times as tranquilly as a natural process. All government intervention has proved powerless against it. If it continues in this fashion, by the end of the century, we shall grow into the decisive power in the land, before which all powers will have to bow, whether they like it or not. End quote. Such a message was also carried faithfully to the working class electorate by the thousands of party activists who joined the various socialist parties during this era, often to the neglect of the trade union movement they left behind. Keir Hardy, a formative figure in the Labour Party in Britain, was an early hero in this mould. Hardy himself, in the personal sense, was no stranger to oppression. Born illegitimate to a farm servant from Lanarkshire in Scotland, he crisscrossed England, Scotland and Wales, building support for the parliamentary road for change. He was, in every respect, an eloquent speaker with, it seemed, a radical vision. He described the type of so socialism he was fighting for as follows. Quote, the ugliness and squalor which now meets you at every turn in some of the most beautiful valleys in the world would disappear. The rivers would run pure and clear as they did of yore, and in the winter the log would glow on the fire the while the youths and the maidens made glad the heart with mirth and song, and there would be beauty and joy everywhere." End quote. In his eyes, the important thing was to participate in the electoral process. Parliament was a good institution, with real power and the potential to satisfy the democratic wishes of the people. The problem, as he saw it, was that rich people kept getting elected to its hallowed halls. If this could be changed, if people from a working class background who knew what it was like to be poor were elected, then things could be changed. As went the ditty, popularised among Australian workers at the beginning of the 20th century to win support for the Australian Labour Party, ALP, then keep your heads, I say, my boys, your comrades in the town, will help you get to win the vote and put your tyrant down. The ballot is the thing, the boys. The ballot is the thing. The ballot, in other words, became everything. Quote, Until the First World War, social democratic parties worked mainly to obtain democratic reforms, such as the extension of the suffrage, first to males, then to women, as well as seeking the secret ballot, equal constituencies, and, quote, one man, one vote, end quote. Particularly in the Northern European countries, this prioritising affected the whole social struggle. Labour and socialist parties not only set the agenda, but they also tended to foist this agenda with greater and lesser degrees of success on the wider trade union movement. Thus, the real threat posed by industrial-based struggles was at first moderated, then later dispersed. In many countries, workers played a militant part in winning an extension of the franchise. In Belgium, Austria and Finland, among others, general strikes ushered in more extensive voting rights. But, at the end of the day, the workers' role was secondary. Once representation in Parliament was achieved, the job of building socialism fell into the capable hands of the parliamentary socialists. A convenient outcome, as it turned out. For the parliamentary socialists, the great prize had always been to win control of the state. Through enlightened leadership, they argued, the state could be used for the benefit of society at large. What happened in reality? From the earliest days, divisions occurred. The demands of electoralism were all important, and as early as 1890, Bernstein in Germany signalled the importance of this issue. Declaring that democracy was the high school of compromise, he argued successfully in the German SDP for a policy of moderation and alliance with forces that did not share in the desire for fundamental wealth distribution. The eventual aim was still socialism, he argued, but for the present, the immediate goals must take precedence. Quote, 
For me, the achievement of the most immediate demands is the main thing, not only because they are of great propagandist value and serve to enlist the masses, but also because, in my opinion, this gradual process, this gradual socialization, is the method strongly indicated for a progressive transition. End quote. A viewpoint that culminated in Bernstein's now classic reformulation of his priorities and those of the GSPD, when he stated, quote, The movement means everything. What was usually called the final aim of socialism, nothing. On the other side of the world, matters were not much different, though they were a might more successful. The ALP had been formed after a series of industrial defeats by Australian workers in the last decade of the 19th century. From this bitter legacy, quote, there emerged a determination to right the wrongs through committed parliamentary action, end quote. The ALP achieved success early on, particularly at the regional state level. This, quote, early progress of Australian labour and politics attracted the interests of the rest of the world, end quote. But at home, doubts were already setting in. During its first periods in power at a regional level, there was disappointment all around. Quote, Labour people commonly criticised their MPs for not being icy enough. They saw Parliament as a comfortable club which seduced Labour members with facilities way beyond the reach of the typical toiler. Higher wages, comfortable leather chairs, billiard tables, dining rooms, well-stocked library, free rail travel and invitations to lavish functions. Close contact with Labour's adversaries could be disarming too. After lashing union bashers in the hustings, it was a different matter altogether to confront them in relaxing surroundings and find that they are not bad blokes to share a drink with or a game of cards with. Many Labour men, quote, were obliged to adjust and often did without being aware of the process, end quote. And indeed, in power, Labour were moderate. The ALP formed its first federal Australian government in 1910. The success, quote, was saluted as the culmination of 20 years of arduous work, end quote. True to form, the ALP, quote, enacted far more legislation than any previous national administration. But the overall programme of legislation did not tackle wealth or its distribution. Far from it. A policy of state arbitration of wages and conditions already begun under the previous non-Labour government was extended, as was a tax imposed on large ranchers who didn't improve land under their control. Finally, quote, A popular measure, the baby bonus, an allowance of £5 payable at the birth of each white Australian child, end quote. As perhaps might be expected from a party whose members regularly, quote, said grace before meals and toasted the monarchy, end quote. Worse was to come. The Labour Party in Britain came to power unexpectedly when it won 191 seats in the House of Commons in the general election of December 1923. Unlike its Australian counterpart, it had, previous to this, adopted some definite policies on wealth redistribution. As Keith Laybourne notes in his book The Rise of Labour, the party of hope and aspiration had come to office. It was to be a bitter lesson for the workers of Britain. Philip Snowden, the first Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer, introduced a budget he claimed was, quote, vindication against no class and no interest, end quote. In fact, at the time, it was said to have had, quote, devastating consequences for working class living standards, end quote. In any case, Snowden's first budget, quote, received the general approval of all sides in, of the House of Commons. It was praised by the Tories and Liberals just as much as the Labour politicians, end quote. Though a number of years later, quote, looking back on his life, Snowden was able to justify his performance as follows, quote, I have been active in political life for 40 years and my only object has been to improve the lot of the toiling millions. That is still my aim and my object. And if I ask for some temporary suspension, some temporary sacrifices, it is because that is necessary to make future progress possible, end quote. A disastrous result and a cause for dismay in labour ranks? Far from it. On falling from power at the end of 1924, the first Labour Party Prime Minister in British history, Ramsay MacDonald, felt moved enough to write to the King about the Labour Party's performance impressing on him as follows. They, the Labour Party, 
have shown the country that they have the capacity to govern in an equal degree with the other parties in the House, and, considering their lack of experience, have acquitted themselves with credit in the House of Commons. The Labour government has also shown the country that patriotism is not the monopoly of any single class or party. They have in fact demonstrated that they, no less than any other party, recognise their duties and responsibilities, and have done much to dispel the fantastic and extravagant belief which at one time found expression that they were nothing but a band of irresponsible revolutionaries intent on wreckage and destruction." End quote. Almost immediately, when some degree of success came their way, the trend amongst the Labour and Socialist parties of the world was away from the working class. In Australia, quote, Party militants were disillusioned by Labour's orientation in office towards the whole community rather than the working class exclusively, end quote. This reflected electoral concerns, principally the desire to appear moderate and accommodating to the wider electorate even to those sections whose interests conflicted directly with the interests of workers. This resulted in even more moderate policies as time progressed, a point that was noted by commentators. Quote, Although during the interwar period, Social Democrats had won office in Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Great Britain, Norway and Sweden, quote, with the exception of the French armaments industry in 1936, not a single company was nationalised, end quote. Instead of opting for policies of public ownership previously advocated, the Socialist and Labour parties, quote, attempted to mitigate the worst aspects of capitalism. They worked for social reforms in housing, education, wage rates, unemployment protection and pensions, end quote, expounding in the end, quote, a welfareism that was often little different from liberalism, end quote a project that was eloquently captured by Ben Chiftley, Labour Prime Minister in Australia from 1945 to 49, when he said, quote, We have a great objective, the light on the hill, which we aim to reach by working for the betterment of mankind, not only here, but anywhere we may give a helping hand, end quote. On occasions when workers resisted, expecting, well they might, that Labour would be more sympathetic to their cause, the results were a brutal eye-opener, a case in point being the 1946 railway strike in Australia. The ALP were in power just one year when this nationwide dispute broke out. The Labour minister in charge, Hanlon, himself a former strike leader in the infamous Brisbane general strike of 1912, quote, exceeded his own draconian response to the 1946 metalworkers strike. He proclaimed a state of emergency under the Transport Act, authorised the arrest of strike leaders and the rank and file picketers, and portrayed the dispute as a civil war. End quote. The strike continued, however, so quote, Hanlon rushed through the Parliament the Industrial Law Amendment Act, which gave the police even wider powers than the state of emergency. They could now take action against anyone they considered might be prolonging the strike. They could arrest without warrant, prohibit picketing, enter union offices or meetings at any time, and use force when they considered it necessary. On St. Patrick's Day, a small orderly demonstration was brutally attacked without warning by a large police contingent. End quote. Summing up his impressions after being arrested, one Australian Railways Union member said of the Labour Party, if ever there was a weak collection of salary-chasing opportunist humbugs devoid of any semblance of working-class principles, it was the members of the Labour Party, end quote. He concluded that no anti-Labour government, quote, could have been more vicious. The emergence of the parliamentary socialist movement in the early part of the 20th century played a key role in breaking large sections of the working class away from their own independent efforts at bringing about change. As a result, a form of democracy that was both tokenistic and insubstantial became the order of the day. This was a major achievement for the rich and privileged. The particular result, however, was not so much that social peace prevailed, rather that other forms of democracy, more substantive in content and less acceptable to the interests of the rich and privileged, were smothered or, at the very least, curtailed. These forms, ideas of direct action and direct democracy, democracy in the workplace, etc., posed a real challenge to the social order in that they brought the disenfranchised into the struggle for an improved society as participants rather than as observers, a difference that mattered enormously in the long run. <laughs>
There would be one significant exception to this overall trend. This was Spain. Here, the anarchist movement was strong enough from the earliest days to set a political course independent of parliamentary socialism. At the core of the anarchist strategy was direct democracy and direct action. Eschewing the parliamentary road in all its trappings, anarchists advocated that instead the workers should reclaim democracy at their place of power, at work and on the street. This strategy was to be the basis for the most important example of democratic practice in the 20th century, the workers' collectives built during the Spanish Revolution in 1936 to 1937. Manufacturing Consent The arrival of the popular vote, universal suffrage, marked an important transition in those societies that granted it. This was the change in the political order from one in which the mass of people were excluded from having any say to one in which they were nominally included. Finally, and despite the delay, it was being recognised that power in society derived from the people. For the present, it was intended that this power w would be carefully managed, through Parliament, and neutralised for the most part. But even so, it was an important concession. The arrival of the vote was a recognition that all people, irrespective of title or wealth, were entitled to an equal say in the running society. This remains, for most people, an appealing idea. Secondly, the vote gave people leverage, albeit of a very weak kind, a situation that was most obvious at election time. Tipping over themselves to get elected to Parliament and serve the people, politicians were liable to promise anything. This raised expectations in the electorate and, as was usually the case, indignation later. But even so, on some occasions, real concessions were achieved. How was this new situation to be managed? On the one hand, there were the demands of the electorate. On the other hand, there was the usual business of government. These two interests did not necessarily go hand in hand. Government, in its old age sense, was primarily concerned with one major objective. This was overseeing the conditions in which business could prosper. Enacting laws, ensuring that social peace prevailed and bringing the forces of the state to bear on the unruly, were the traditional roles of government. Over time, these important primary tasks had not disappeared. Far from it. As the 20th century progressed and the economy of the world grew, the instability of an economic system that rested primarily on exploitation became more apparent. Left to its own devices, capitalism undoubtedly created great wealth for the rich and privileged. But, and this was its great misfortune, it also created massive misery. Invariably, bust followed boom and depression followed growth. A century that produced two world wars and the Great Depression inevitably brought those theories, Keynesianism in particular, that argued for more state intervention in society's affairs and for greater management of the economy. To an extent, this was a break with the past. But less obvious at the time was the long, longer term shift in emphasis that occurred generally in the more economically advanced countries. The state, previously the agent of the rich and privileged, shifted from being a partisan player in the struggle between the rich and poor to the new and more benign role of mediator. This required, in turn, a new type of political operation, where consensus between the classes replaced confrontation, and under the guise of parliamentary democracy, exploitation was carried on as before. This new state of affairs, a reflection in part of greater suffrage and a reflection in part of new priorities among the rich and privileged, emerged across the world in a piecemeal fashion. In Europe, war and its after effects, including revolution and economic depression, checked any immediate shift from the traditional method of repression. On the contrary, progress was slow and it was only towards the end of the 1940s that the modern parliamentary democracies emerged fully formed. The USA, for reasons briefly mentioned above, was different. Already one of the strongest economies by World War I, it progressed unhindered towards the modern model of parliamentary democracy from the beginning of the century. Though it didn't concede full suffrage until 1961, on foot of the civil rights movement, it already operated reasonably smoothly and without major hiccup from the 1870s onwards. It was here in conditions of economic stability and growth that the influential American Democrat, Walter Lippmann, examined the new priorities and the new problems of democracy from the perspective of the rich and privileged. Widely praised for his progressive views, it would appear, 
Lippmann provided the modern-day reasoning for public thought control. The masses, as he saw, were the problem. Technically, they had a role to play in the new democratic order, but this, out of necessity, was passive. As he saw it, the public, quote, does not reason, investigate, invent, persuade, bargain or settle, end quote. The public's ability to understand the complex nature of society, the important issues of the day, or for that matter, to evaluate the common interest, was limited. The public, as he noted, was ill-informed. Quote, In the absence of institutions and education by which the environment is so successfully reported that the realities of public opinion stand out very sharply against self-centred opinion, the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialised class whose personal interests reach beyond the locality. In Lippmann's eyes then, two important roles formed the basis of the new democratic order, that is, parliamentary democracy. Quote, Firstly, there is the role assigned to the specialist class, the insiders, the responsible men, who have access to information and understanding. These public men are responsible for the formation of a sound public opinion. They initiate, they administer, they settle, and should be protected from ignorant and troublesome outsiders. The second role is the task of the public, which is much more limited, Lippmann explains. It is not for the public to pass judgment, but merely to place its forces at the disposal of one or other of the responsible men. The public acts only by aligning itself as the partisan of someone in a position to act exclusively, end quote. This is narrator's uh, comment again. If you want to see where those quotes come from, then you can see them in the text version linked below. Lippmann describes this new order of things as a revolution in, quote, the practice of democracy. The public's opinion must be shaped and formed so that the important decisions can be made in their name. He describes this process honestly as, quote, the manufacture of consent, noting that, quote, it is a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government, end quote. These priorities, articulated by Lippmann and others, were not new. In fact, they were strikingly similar to earlier views. For example, J.S. Mill's advice that, quote, the intellectual classes should lead the government and the government should lead the stupid classes. But other, newer developments had compounded the problem from the perspective of the rich and privileged. During the interwar years, 1918-39, to 39, newspaper readership rose steadily, as did cinema attendance and radio listenership. The first television networks were on air in the late 40s. This brought change in its own right. For the first time in history, the technology, wealth and means existed to implement democracy in a mass scale. Democracy, in its proper sense, had always consisted of two aspects. The first of these was having the power to take decisions. This was a right that was increasingly being won as the 20th century proceeded. But the second of these aspects was, to a point, more difficult to achieve. This was providing people with the information around which decisions could be based. This was especially important with the emergence of national economies and with the increasing enlargement of society to include larger geographical areas. The mass media was a potential solution to this need. Large sections of the population, for the first time, had access to the media at low cost. In this way, they could keep informed and abreast of major political and social events of the day, from beginning through to end. Such was the potential of the emerging newspaper and radio industry, and later on, television. But it was not to be used for these democratic objectives. The new era of parliamentary democracy was dominated by the idea of manufacturing consent. Not surprisingly, this process relied heavily on the emergent mass media, the primary objective was not to, quote, investigate and inform, but to, quote, report and shape. By virtue of what was or wasn't reported, the nature and basis of political debate could be set and altered. Certain viewpoints, conducive to the interests of the rich and privileged, tended to dominate on the airwaves and in political debate. Other viewpoints, less friendly, received less attention 
the general bias in the media has been best explained by Noam Chomsky and Edward S. Herman. In Manufacturing Consent, they outlined how the modern media operates its bias not through any one particular agent, but rather through a series of effects. None of these effects, if taken in isolation, would constitute a dominant influence on what the news media presents. But taken together, they can and often do. These effects they call filters. Taken together, these filters alter the balance of news coverage in favour of the current economic structure. In Manufacturing Consent, the following five are listed. Ownership, size and profit orientation of the dominant mass media firms. The modern media is largely in private hands, despite the existence of many national radio and TV stations. Some of these news networks, News International, Hearst, etc., are multi-billion pound businesses, with their own profit demands. Many news companies also invest outside of the media, in mining, manufacturing, etc., giving them a vested interest in the current unequal state of the world. 2. Advertising is the primary income source of the mass media. Most radio, TV and newspapers depend heavily on advertising. There are two aspects to this. Advertising revenue acts as a subsidy to production costs, allowing advertiser-friendly media to undercut and expand relative to their advertiser-unfriendly rivals. Secondly, as is well known, Advertising is mainly funded by private business, leading to an inbuilt subsidy to business-friendly media and coverage. Media that challenges the direct interests of the rich and privileged will simply not get advertising revenues. Accordingly, it may not survive, or if it does, it will remain small and underfunded. 3. Media reliance on information provided by government, business and experts funded by same. The media news services rely on respectable sources for news. In part, this is to save on costs, but it also reflects the need to get information from official sources and not just anyone. The government is often relied on because the government is neutral. The results are predictable. 4. Flack as a means of disciplining the media. The media is seen as an important arena of debate in many parliamentary democratic societies. For this reason, many think tanks target the media and monitor its output. Think tanks are not cheap to set up or run. Needless to say, they are funded by and support those who have money and privilege. They can play a vital role in altering the focus of the media on an issue. 5. Anti-communism as a control mechanism Anti-communism can mean the traditional Cold War rhetoric that was powerful in the USA and in Western Europe for much of the last 50 years, but it can also be the general idea of socialism. Labelling a journalist pro-communist or the coverage of a strike as pro-communist is often a subtle but powerful way of putting pressure on a news feature to moderate its focus, especially if the said coverage or journalist is anything but communist. News coverage of parliamentary elections is a special application of the above. Coverage is shaped by a number of key assumptions, many of which are generalised within the media services to such an extent that they are seen as being beyond question. Yet these assumptions influence the reporting, the evaluation and the assessments of elections, thereby structuring the discussion and debate in society in a way that is suitable to those who already have power and privilege. Some of these assumptions are listed below. They can be easily seen. 1. Parliamentary elections are democracy in action. 2. A parliamentary election is your chance to have a real say. 3. The political parties who offer themselves for election are varied and quite different. They represent the full spectrum of political options. 4. Politicians going back on their promises is just human nature. 5. The outcome of an election makes a real difference. Fundamentally important issues relating to parliamentary elections are never examined or pursued by the media, for clearly evident reasons. As will be seen below, many elections repeat certain themes, quote, putting the people first, investing in education and health, tackling crime, yet precious little ever happens or changes. So does your vote actually have any effect?
Is there an actual, as opposed to a nominal, choice at election time? Will a politician keep his or her word? These are important questions and are central to the subject of democracy, yet they are carefully avoided by a media attendant to the interests of the powerful and privileged. Did I say that? The idea of Parliament derives from the advisor groups that were appointed by the King in medieval times. The first Parliaments, for example those in England, were completely staffed with cronies of the monarch, various barons and bishops and earls who were seen as wise and of sound mind. Such persons were there to counsel the King on his decisions, though it was understood that the King was not bound to follow their advice. Since only the King was privy to all the information, it was accepted that only the King should have the executive power, that is the power to make the actual laws. Modern government is still based on this old model. This can be seen in a number of ways. One surviving similarity is the idea of having two parts to the decision making system in government. An executive part and a parliamentary part. In some countries, the parliament has the job of discussing and debating, and is somewhat advisory in its role, whereas the executive actually proposes and implements laws. Depending on the particular country, the executive can be chosen in different ways. In Ireland and the UK, for example, the executive is usually composed of a group drawn from the largest political party in the parliament, whereas in the USA, the executive is elected separately. Either way, the great change with the past, we are told, is that we now choose who will be in the parliament and who will be in the executive. Because of this, the decisions that are taken should reflect what we think. True? The answer, most definitely, is no. A second similarity with the old medieval system makes sure of that. This is the notion that only the executive is privy to all the information necessary to make decisions and in essence is the only body in society that can and should be allowed to make laws. So while politicians do stand at election time for various policies and positions and the voters cast their ballots on the basis of these policies, an elected politician is not bound by any law to follow these previously proclaimed policies and positions. Indeed, once elected, a member of government a politician is entirely within his or her rights to jettison any promises he or she may have made at the election. The politician in question is quite entitled legally to say, quote, Having examined the state of the public finances, I have changed my mind about what I previously said. I now think the opposite. It is through this notion that an elected parliament is able to discard the wishes of the electorate and to act as it sees fit. In actual practice, this is how your vote is discarded. Though this idea that a politician is not bound by your vote may seem like a minor technicality, it is not in practice. The idea that Parliament and the Executive should retain autonomy from those that elect them was deliberately retained during the period of reform that saw suffrage being extended to the mass of people in society. Though people were gradually granted the right to vote for who should make up Parliament, the crucial right of a direct input was withheld. As J.S. Mill emphasised in a subtle but meaningful way, democracy is, quote, not that the people govern themselves, but that they should have the security for good government. To see how effective Parliament is at remaining independent of the electorate's wishes, it is worth looking at a few examples. These, it should be said, have been chosen at random. There are hundreds of others, and each election throws up a new set. The following, however, do show the scope of the problem. Peru. The elections in Peru in 1990 were fought against a backdrop of increasing poverty and economic ruin. The Peruvian electorate was offered a choice between the policies of Mario Vargas Llosa and those of Alberto Fujimoro. Llosa a writer and something of a novice in politics, made his policies well known. He argued stridently for austerity and for massive cuts to anti-poverty programs in Peru, such as they existed, as a means of curbing the state's debt. Fujimoro, who was also somewhat new to politics, said a lot less, but campaigned openly as 
an alternative to Yosa. Not surprisingly, the election saw the wise people vote against Yosa and his IMF-sponsored policies. Fujimoro won. Yet within months, Fujimoro adopted Yosa's previously stated policies and inaugurated unprecedented cutbacks and attack on, on the poor, a process that later came to be known as Fuji Shock. USA Bill Clinton's victory in 1992 came after 12 years of Reaganomics, policies that had led to a massive shift in wealth from the poor to the rich. Clinton made a number of important promises, some directly economic and some related to social issues. The introduction of a national healthcare system was central to Clinton's campaign and directly affected some 35 million US citizens. Clinton eventually abandoned the idea of a promised medical insurance system in 1995. It has not resurfaced. In fact, there were more Americans without medical insurance at the end of Clinton's first term of office than before it began. Clinton's election slogan was, quote, to put people first, a policy that had a certain ring to it after so many years of Reaganomics. Yet Clinton quickly changed his mind once elected and adopted what later became known as the Wall Street strategy. As one commentator said, quote, But after the election, his economic team convinced him instead to concentrate on reducing the deficit, end quote. A strategy that led Clinton to abolish the heating subsidy for over 5 million poor Americans and to put a two-year limit on welfare payments, after which time a person had to take a job no matter what the pay, or starve. Gay Americans played a prominent part in Clinton's campaign and were promised equality of service in the US Armed Forces as, as a reward. This was abandoned within a year in favour of a don't ask, don't tell policy. Ireland Before the 1987 general election, Fianna Fáil flooded the country with posters and billboards declaring, quote, Health cuts hurt the old, the sick and the handicapped, end quote. Within months of their being returned to government, they were implementing massive cutbacks in spending on health. Prior to the general election of 1982, Fine Gael took out newspaper advertisements warning that if Fianna Fáil were elected, they would impose a new local tax in the form of service charges. Fianna Fáil, meanwhile, warned in the same newspapers that if Fianna Gael won, they would impose service charges. The Labour Party made a, quote, clear and unambiguous statement that they were totally opposed to such charges. Following the election, a Fine Gael Labour government was formed and in July 1983, the Local Government Provisions Act No. 2 was passed by them. This empowered county managers to charge for services. Fianna Fáil fought the subsequent 1985 local elections on an anti-service charge ticket, but immediately after the elections, their councillors around the country did a U-turn and voted for the charges. Just before the general election of 1987, Fianna Fáil gave a written guarantee to the National Association of Tenants Organisations, NATO, that if returned to government, they would scrap local charges. They were... And they didn't. In fact, charges continued to be levied for the next decade until a massive campaign of people power led to their abolition. Over that 10 year period, several TDs were elected to Dáil Éireann on anti-charges tickets. Eamon Gilmore, Kathleen Lynch, both Democratic Left, and Emmett Stagg, Labour, were all initially involved in anti-charges campaigns and were actively calling on people not to pay the charges yet all ended up in a government which was dragging people before the courts for exactly that. Australia The 1993 general election in Australia was a close-run affair. Eventually, it did end with a win for the ALP, Australian Labour Party, who partly secured their victory by promising some popular reforms aimed at improving hospital waiting lists and helping the middle range of people financially through tax reform. These promised reforms played an important part in the election since the gap between the rich and poor in Australia had widened considerably during the 1980s. Yet by August of 1993, just three months after that election, 
the ALP had ditched five specific promises it had made at the election. 1. A special tax relief for pensioners. 2. A dental health assistance subsidy for low-income earners. 3. Money to be made available to pay for private hospital beds in order to cut waiting lists. 4. Improvement to housing grants. and 5. A broad tax cut. France During the presidential election in 1995, Chirac made an important, in the eyes of the electorate, promise not to, quote, raise taxes. He also promised to create jobs by increased spending. A few months after his election, during the notoriously quiet summer period in French politics, Chirac's Prime Minister, Alain Chappé, presented a, quote, supplementary budget to raise an extra £6 billion in taxes by the end of the year, which interestingly, noted The Economist, hit the poor hardest. Not that this sufficed. In a later twist, Chappé and Chirac, having promised to create 700,000 jobs by the end of 1996, ended up increasing unemployment by announcing spending cuts of £5 billion to, quote, meet the Maastricht criteria. Brazil The seasoned politician, Fernando Cardoso, used a thoughtful ploy on his campaign trail that saw him win the 1994 election. Before the crowds, he would hold up his hand and begin ticking off each of his main priorities. Health, education, housing, infrastructure and employment. One for each finger. It was obviously effective in a country notorious for its levels of inequality. 1% of the population of Brazil received 15% of the income in 1994 alone. Yet Cardoso seemed to have forgotten all of this less than one year later, when, noted The Economist, quote, In Congress, Mr. Cardoso and his team have been busy with a package of market-freeing constitutional reforms needed both to keep inflation down and ensure growth. A set of priorities that made him veto the minimum wage rise and introduce, quote, a tall order in legislation of such magnitude, in fact, that, quote, Britain's Conservatives have not achieved it in 16 years. Many roads, one destination. The important issues in politics are as plainly obvious in India as anywhere else in the world, if not more so. The country that is often called the largest democracy in the world is also one of the most unequal. Some 36% of the population are estimated to be living in absolute poverty, a condition defined by the UN as malnutrition, illiteracy, disease, high infant mortality or low life expectancy. Alongside this, the top 10% of Indian society absorbed nearly 35% of the income of the nation in 1985 alone, skewing the wealth distribution into even more unequal figures. These are startling statistics, but in a society in which the people rule, this situation, one would predict, should be quickly changed. Plain self-interest should see to that. After all, with so many poor people in such a majority, it would seem to be just a case of simple mathematics to right the wrong. One election is all that it should take. Yet what has happened? In fact, the opposite has occurred. Despite some 40 years of parliamentary democracy and universal suffrage, India's inequality has remained impervious to change for the better. In the last decade or so, the gap has actually been growing again. The reasons why are not difficult to discover, nor are they particularly Indian in content. Indian politics has been dominated almost since independence by the Congress Party, a political movement that is seen by many, interestingly, to be on the left and even to have socialist ideas. The other significant party is the BJP. Besides the BJP, there is a host of smaller parties, some on the left, others on the right. However, none of these dent the arena of national politics, so the practical choice is between only two parties, Congress and the BJP. Asked to clarify the differences between these two political parties in 1993, an Indian business journalist saw none in practice. Both parties, he concluded, were, quote, travelling down the one road.
The only point of difference between the BJP and Congress, he pointed out, was the speed of the journey and the, quote, side of the road they were travelling on. So while the electorate in India does have a choice at election time, both parties in the roster have, in effect, the same overall policies. What are these? Politics in India has been dominated since its foundation by the broad idea of reform. More recently, however, these reforms have had a more focused target. According to the Indian Prime Minister, P. V. Rao of the Congress Party, they, quote, had to do with changes in the Companies Act, capital acquisition tax and the financial sector reforms. And also, quote, introducing value-added tax. Noting the effect of these reforms, The Economist recorded a familiar picture. It reported that, quote, Among unskilled Indians, real wages dropped in the first 18 months of economic reforms. End quote. Not that this was the entire picture. Far from it. Though grain production in India was enlarging under the new reforms, quote, Not many people know it, but India is sitting on a mountain of 30 million tonnes of grain. End quote. The Economist went on to point out that, quote, the poor could no longer afford to buy. Indeed, even Prime Minister Rao, the architect of the reforms, was appalled at this and lashed out that it was, quote, scandalous that grain should be exported when so many Indians still go hungry. Though in a speech to the Federation of the Indian Chambers of Commerce two years earlier, in a more sober mood, he had said about the reforms, quote, the difficult part lies ahead. We have a long way to go. The journey is bound to be long and difficult. End quote. And returning to that all important question, that of speed, he said, quote, The pace of reform would be governed by the ability of the system to absorb changes without collapsing. End quote. Such are the realities of the largest democracy in the world. Providing no effective choice to the electorate amid the colour, pomp and drama of general election fever is the stuff of parliamentary democracy. In this game, the media play a valuable and vital role, the 1993 parliamentary election in Australia being a case in point. It was described by one of the main national papers as, quote, the most important election since World War II. Yet when asked to point out the differences between the two options being offered to the electorate, four different financial commentators saw no, quote, real differences that mattered in the long run. Why this was so is quite easy to see. The Australian Labour Party had been in power throughout the 80s in Australia and had presided over, quote, a historic drop in wages and a variety of, quote, labour market reforms that had, quote, borne fruit. Challenging the ALP were the traditional parties of big business and big farmers, an alliance of the Liberal and the Country Party, whose central election policy was the introduction of VAT, a tax that invariably affects the poor more than the well-off. The ALP eventually won the election after issuing a slew of promises, quickly forgotten, see above. Though when he addressed a large, quote, group of business leaders, shortly afterwards, the ALP leader Paul Keating was less forgetful. In his speech, Keating, quote, foreshadowed a historic deregulation of the labour market, end quote. Though he stressed, being a man who had not, quote, forgotten his roots, that, quote, economic reform should be moderated by a concern for the disadvantaged. Not that this, quote, should put the government and business at odds, he added. The success of economic policy depends on the success of business. We can look anywhere else in the globe and see a similar process. The presidential elections in Honduras in 1989 were hailed as a milestone, though the effective choice between the candidates left a lot to be desired. Quote, the elections were effectively restricted to two candidates, one from a family of wealthy industrialists, the other from a family of large landowners, end quote. Even top advisers to both camps acknowledged that, quote, there is little substantive difference between the two and the policies they would follow as president. Not that a lacklustre campaign resulted. The candidates, noted Central America report, quote, relied on insults and accusations to entertain the crowds at campaign rallies and political functions, end quote. 
As US President Bush pointed out about the victor, Rafael Callejas, he is, quote, an inspiring example of the democratic promise that is spreading throughout the Americas. In Eastern Europe, the experience of parliamentary democracy is somewhat new, but it is not that much different. Quote, painful shock therapy, end quote, was used on many of the countries in this region after the fall of state capitalism and Soviet power. This, quote, free market madness provoked a backlash in the population. Are we surprised? With the result that, quote, reformed communists have come back into power on waves of discontent. The Economist noted. In Poland, this saw a victory for the Democratic Left Alliance, DLA, in 1993, in the parliamentary election, and again in 1995, in the presidential election. Quote, the once despised ex-communists gained votes by acknowledging the suffering of ordinary people. What did this sensitivity translate into? The Economist, no friend of the DLA's, pointed out that the situation was, quote, not as bad as it looked. The DLA, it went on, is led by, quote, young urbane politicians who claim to be social democrats and preached free market reforms and privatisation. Assessing the impact of the election, they concluded, quote, it is possible that the new government can be a little kinder to those in need without seriously jeopardising the reform programme, which seems to be quite accurate in hindsight. The gap between the rich and poor is continuing to skyrocket in Poland and throughout most of former Eastern Europe. As one piece of astute Polish graffiti pointed out, quote, We wanted democracy, but we ended up with the bond market. Providing no effective choice is the reality in the vast majority of parliamentary democracies. Parties vie for power at election time, the campaigns are often hard fought and tough, but the only difference lies in the faces that make up the next parliament, not in the policies. To all intents and purposes, these policies continue as before, unabated. This is the case in the majority of countries that are called parliamentary democracies, but it is not the case in all, and this must be borne in mind. Indeed, parliamentary democracy is often most successful as a form of political control, as opposed to a form of democracy, because of its apparent openness, and because of the fact that popular constituencies are often encouraged to participate in it. Many like to believe that if we got elected, we would be different, despite the mounting evidence to the contrary. The history of parliamentary democracy is littered with examples of this. Parties and individuals who, quote, become identified with the masses and carry for them, quote, their hopes and dreams. As was noted earlier with the examples of parliamentary socialism, the anger of the poor is often channeled into parliament and away from the workplace and the street where it can be particularly powerful. Once in parliament, it gradually gets, quote, lost and forgotten about. A recent example of this dynamic is the case of Brazil's Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, known as Lula, the former lathe operator turned politician. Indeed, Lula's popularity is legendary with the poor of Brazil. And well it might be. In Brazil, the power of business and the wealthy is only matched by the brutality of the military and the large landowners who have come to dominate. Though phenomenally wealthy, Brazil has been steadily getting worse in terms of the gap between the rich and the poor, a fact that has played no small part in Lula's rise to fame. Brazil is a country where, in that time-worn phrase, quote, the poor appear to have no voice. As chairman of the Workers' Party of Brazil, Lula quickly became such a voice, and in fact, he very nearly won the 1989 presidential election. So large was the genuine affection that was felt for him and his anti-poverty policies. Lula narrowly lost the 1989 presidential election. Why is still a subject for debate. What is clear, however, is that Lula ran a very, quote, radical campaign in 1989. In particular, he refused to compromise on his economic views. As a result, he maximised his vote with the very numerous poor of Brazil. Defeat, however, led to reassessment with the result that Lula, who ran again in 1994, was, quote, importantly different. As The Economist noted, Lula, quote, 
may still rail against capitalism, but at round tables and in the auditorium he takes care to turn down the volume. Indeed, the politician who boasted, quote, I'd never wear a coat and tie, went out of his way to present a different impression in 1994. Quote, in Washington, 700 bankers and the like crowded into a hall to hear him speak. This was when he was 40% ahead in the polls. So great was the change in Lula, in fact, that some wondered about, quote, who the real Lula was though others were less bothered. Jose Sobrino, chairman of Banco Pontual in San Paulo, observed, quote, Lula attacks the banks for earning too much, but these days he also says the financial sector is a necessary evil. A view underscored by another businessman, Emerson Capaz, who, quote, lavishes praise on his rival, noting that Lula, quote, understands that he cannot govern alone. These meetings with businessmen are not just for form's sake. He was looking for an alliance that will make it possible. This example of Lula's turnabout is not unusual. It is quite typical and happens again and again. It was most notable with the rise to power of the various socialist and labour parties of the world. See earlier. But it continues to apply in any situation where a large grassroots movement seeks, quote, a voice in parliament. On the electoral road to power, political parties of the left, in particular, go through a process of adaptation and realism. Their radicalism is gradually diluted away so as to, quote, send the right message. The important constraints of electoralism, to build alliances, to retain a positive media image, all take their toll. Radical politics is the inevitable casualty. Occasionally it does happen that individuals and parties get into power with the intention of making a few changes and or fulfilling their popular mandate. This is rare, but when it does happen, other important constraints are brought to bear on the situation in order to prevent an unwelcome outcome. These are the financial markets and the threat of a coup. The financial markets, more than any other single factor, are playing an increasingly important role in constraining your vote. Though the effect of the markets is somewhat dependent on the size and relative economic independence of the particular country involved, it is nevertheless becoming an important factor almost everywhere with time. The effect of the financial markets can be in a number of different ways. 1. When an elected government does pursue, on occasion, a policy that conflicts with the overall interests of business, the prospect of flight of capital can be brought into play as a means of disciplining that government. This happened in the very notable case of France in 1981, after the victory of the French Socialist Party. Quote, Initial hostility on the part of business was manifested in manoeuvres to avoid nationalisation and a flight of capital abroad. End quote. This was evident in the French media where, quote, businessmen made a show of studied pessimism, painting reality in excessively dark colours and discouraging hiring and investment, end quote. France entered a crisis and in due course, after the balance of power within the French Socialist Party shifted back towards a more moderate programme, French business once again, quote, became prepared to play its role with a certain amount of loyalty. 2. A similar, though importantly different, example is the recent case of South Africa. Here the source of financial constraint is non-national, unlike in the case of France above. The actual achievement of popular suffrage in South Africa after a long and bitter struggle against the apartheid system fueled real expectations that substantial change would occur in the aftermath of the vote in April 1994 in particular with regard to wealth distribution. This did not occur. The Irish Times correspondent in South Africa, Edward O'Loughlin, noted in December 1994, seven months after government formation, that the ANC's key problem, quote, 
is growing discontent among its black constituency, which believes the ANC has done little to improve their lot since taking power. End quote. However, despite this, in March 1995, the same correspondent reported that, quote, South Africa's second post-apartheid budget has once again demonstrated the commitment of the country's new rulers to fiscal discipline and free market reforms, end quote. Noting that the ANC's programme had been, quote, tempered by reality, O'Loughlin reported that the budget message was overshadowed, quote, by the ongoing crisis over exchange rates and exchange controls. Indeed, the rands, South Africa's currency, fall from grace, its value slumped against the US dollar, was as a result of rumours and perceptions. Though the London-based Financial Times was less circumspect in assessing the impact of this, it noted that Trevor Manuel, the ANC's Minister of Finance, had, quote, moved a long way towards embracing free market policies. The challenge now is to persuade the rest of the ANC, and in particular its union and communist allies, to catch up. Emphasising the, quote, disciplinary effect of the currency problem, the Financial Times continued. The value of the rand in the months ahead is likely to provide an accurate reflection of the progress of that political struggle. 3. The third example is more general, but it is also the most indicative of how little parliamentary democracy can mean in today's world. With the financial markets skewed towards the rich and powerful countries in the first world, more dependent economies are increasingly cut adrift by decisions made in, say, Washington, London or Tokyo. A classic example being the 1979 decision by the chairman of the US Federal Reserves, Paul Volcker, to, quote, raise the rate of interest and thereby also to raise the value of the dollar. According to The Economist, Andre Frank, this decision, quote, was the single most important cause of the debt crisis and consequently the depression and lost decade of the 80s, end quote. Indeed, in Latin America and Africa, the cause of this depression remains untold, though of huge dimension. Perhaps tens of thousands of lives were lost as a result of this financial decision. Frank also notes... Interestingly, that even in the specific context of parliamentary democracy, neither the American electorate, nor the Congress, nor the President had any, quote, right to intervene in such a decision of the Federal Reserve. A timely reminder of the limits of parliamentary democracy, if such a reminder is still needed. In contrast to the remoteness and subtlety of the financial markets, the threat of a coup is an entirely different matter though no less unreal if we are to judge by even relatively recent examples, e.g. Haiti in 1991, Algeria in 1992, Nigeria in 1993, to name just a few. It is often assumed that such coups occur in situations where radical policies are involved, but this, surprisingly enough, is not the case. Coups in parliamentary democracies often occur against relatively reasonable governments. A fact that supports the theory that it is often the broader social movement that is the real target of the military. An important example being the coup against the Allende government in Chile in 1973. It is often not recognised that the reforms being introduced by the popularly elected government of Salvador Allende were for the most part quite benign, involving land reform of large estates with compensation, and nationalisation of copper mines with compensation. However, Allende's period in office was also accompanied by the emergence of, quote, assemblies of workers in factories, people's supply committees in the poblaciones, peasant councils in rural areas, end quote. These groups began to play a more and more important role as Allende's government stalled on implementing its promised policies, quote, Basic demands emerged from these popular organisations. The government was supposed to represent the people. In that case, it should put into operation the policies the people were demanding. End quote. 
Indeed, this popular movement became increasingly confident and impatient as time went on, and in some areas began to supplant the state. Food distribution was taken over by community organisations. Workers became more belligerent and occupied their places of work, ejecting managers. In the countryside, land was occupied. The subsequent coup in Chile led to the loss of thousands of lives and the, quote, liquidation of the left. The rich get richer. George F. Will, 1988 conservative commentator. Politics is about who gets what, especially as a result of government action. Governments change, but policies don't. This, for the most part, is an adequate description of how parliamentary democracy operates. It probably sounds like something an anarchist would say, yet the figures bear out. Take the case of the United States often regarded as the home of democracy, or even the most democratic state in the world. Despite the various changes in government that have occurred in the US over the last 20 to 30 years, there has hardly been a hiccup in the most obvious result of government policy, that rich people have got dramatically richer. Figure 2 shows this. So a reminder that there is a link to the text version in the description where you can find the PDF which has these figures. During the period of time covered by this survey of incomes, 1954 to 84, there have been eight presidential elections in the US. The outcome of these elections has led to a steady exchange between Republicans and Democrats. The following administrations have been in power. Republican from 56 to 60. Democratic from 60 to 64, Democratic from 64 to 68, Republican 68 to 72, Republican 72 to 76, Democratic 76 to 80, Republican 80 to 84. Yet it is clearly evident from figure 2 that universal suffrage has only had a marginal effect, if any, on the policies that have been pursued. The income of the top 40% of US society, the 4th and 5th quintiles, has steadily increased in comparison with the bottom 60%. The real beneficiaries have been the so-called super-rich, the top 5% of the population. As can also be seen in figure 3, the very rich have been holding steady in terms of their percentage holding of wealth in US society, throughout the entire period. Interestingly enough, the one point where their wealth holding dropped by a significant amount between 1972 and 1976 was due to the onset of recession and the oil crisis and not due to any government policy. In fact, to the extent that things have changed at all in any significant way from election to election, they have mostly changed for the worse. The policies implemented by Reagan, Bush and Clinton, Republican, Republican and Democrat, have had a dramatic impact on the distribution of income and wealth in the USA. Kevin Phillips' mainstream study, The Politics of Rich and Poor, described the worsening situation as follows, quote, By the middle of Reagan's second term, Official data had begun to show that America's broadly defined rich, the top half of 1% of the US population, had never been richer. Federal policy favoured the accumulation of wealth and rewarded financial assets. The concentration of income that began in the mid-1970s was accelerating. In 1988, approximately 1.3 million individual Americans were millionaires by assets, up from 574,000 in 1980, 180,000 in 1972, 90,000 in 1964, and just 27,000 in 1953. Even adjusted for inflation, the number of millionaires had doubled between the late 70s and the late 80s. Meanwhile, the number of billionaires, according to Forbes magazine, 
went from a handful in 1981 to 26 in 1986 and 49 in 1987. As of late 1988, Forbes put that year's number at 52 billionaires. End quote. This phenomenal rise in the wealth of the rich occurred at the expense of those who work, it would seem. See figure 4. Phillips continues, quote, Most of the Reagan decade, to put it mildly, was a heyday for unearned income as rents, dividends, capital gains and interest gained relative to wages and salaries as a source of wealth, increasing economic inequality, end quote. A situation that was put down, quite rightly, to Reaganomics. Yet when Reagan and his successor Bush were finally removed from office in 1992 on foot of Clinton's Put People First campaign, the superaccumulation of wealth merely continued. Assessing Clinton's impact after his first term in office in 1996, The Economist reported that, quote, real wages are slightly lower than they were 20 years ago. Inequality had never been higher, as we can see in figure 5. If we look at another flagship of democracy, Britain, the picture is more complex, but broadly similar. Even so, what is interesting about Britain is the presence of the Labour Party, a party that until quite recently was committed to, quote, public ownership of industry, clause 4, among other things. Indeed, on face value, the British electorate would appear to have a reasonable choice at election time, within the confines of very narrow limits, admittedly. Face value is a deceptive thing, of course. Figure 6 shows the distribution of personal income between 1949 and 1976. In Wealth, Income and Equality, A.B. Atkinson gives this assessment. Quote, The overall impression from the figures is a reduction in inequality, but if the decline in the share of the top 1% is ignored, the shape of the distribution of income is not greatly different in 1976 to 77 from what it was in 1949. The major part of the fall in the share of the top 1% is balanced by an increase in the shares of the other groups in the top half of the distribution. The income distribution shows a remarkable stability from year to year. End quote. And of course, it normally follows that if income distribution fails to change, wealth, fixed asset distribution doesn't either. The Labour Party was in power for considerable periods during this time, between 1945 and 51 under Attlee, between 1964 and 70 under Wilson, and traumatically from 1975 to 79 under Wilson and Callaghan, apart from the brief Liberal Labour Pact 1977 to 78. Indeed, Labour's period at the helm coincided with the creation of the welfare state, regarded as the high point of achievement. So much so that the influential Labour MP Anthony Crossland was able to state in The Future of Socialism in 1956 that, quote, Almost all the basic features of traditional pre-1914 capitalism have either been greatly modified or completely transformed. Indeed, Crossland was so carried away with the success of labour and power that he began to wonder if they hadn't gone too far. The heady height of power, one imagines. He said, quote, I'm sure that a definite limit exists to the degree of equality which is desirable, We do not want complete equality of incomes, since responsibility and exceptional talent requires and deserves a differential award. Those who remained outside the corridors of power saw a different and depressingly familiar picture. Richard Titmus, in his study, was one of the first to conclude that, quote, the welfare state in Britain after World War II has not led to any significant redistribution of wealth in favour of the poor classes. An assessment that is backed up by Paget and Patterson in their authoritative study, A History of Social Democracy in Post-War Europe. They note, quote, Britain in the immediate post-war period saw a reduction in pre-tax incomes of the highest earners, 
but the beneficiaries were those in the upper middle income bracket. The share of pre-tax and post-tax income accruing to the bottom third of the income ladder remained steady from 1945 to the mid-1970s. End quote. Wealth distribution, in fact, was hardly affected until the late 1970s, when, on foot of Thatcher's rise to power, the situation dramatically disimproved. So much so that Britain became, quote, the most unequal country in the Western world, end quote, by 1966. It could proudly claim that, quote, the richest fifth of Britain's population enjoy, on average, incomes ten times as high as the poorest fifth. The welfare state was an important development in the post-war period to the extent that it lifted the standard of living of society in general, though it did not markedly affect wealth distribution. This should not actually surprise us since, as commentators have noted, quote, Social Democrats have often regarded the welfare state possessively as their own property, looking to it as a vehicle for this egalitarian philosophy. However, the origins of the welfare state predate government social democracy, and it is a common feature of all capitalist societies, irrespective of their experience of party government. End quote. Nevertheless, as the 1980s proceeded and the balance of power shifted significantly in favour of the rich and privileged, especially in the workplace under the aegis of high managed unemployment, it became possible in many countries to consider ending the welfare state as we know it. This broad objective was achieved in a number of countries in a number of ways. In Britain, it was Thatcherism. In the USA, it was the Reagan and Clinton administrations. In a host of other countries, however, especially in Europe and in Australia, the various Labour and Socialist parties did the bidding. Indeed, the period between 1980 and 1995 is remarkable for the large numbers of socialist and labour parties that came to power in France, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Ireland and coalition, Italy, Belgium, Denmark, Australia and New Zealand to name just some. We can of course speculate on why. Was it a cry for help by the working class and the poor? If so, it went unheard. Speaking about the situation in Spain, Portugal and Greece, Paget and Patterson note that, quote, the hallmark of government social democracy was its pragmatism, most marked in economic policy, end quote. This meant that in Spain and Portugal, for example, socialist governments, quote, introduced austerity programs immediately upon taking office, end quote. In Portugal, this bitter pill meant, quote, cutting subsidies on basic commodities, inevitably driving up basic food prices. At the same time, there was a freeze on wages and a clampdown on public spending, end quote. In Portugal, the purchasing power of its workforce fell by 10% under socialist rule, a situation that was broadly repeated in Spain, Italy, Greece and France, to again name just a few. France, incidentally, shot up the inequality ladder after nearly a decade of socialist party rule. A performance that was repeated on the other side of the world, in Australia, where the ALP was in power under Hawke and Keating for almost all of the 80s. Here, quote, many ALP supporters accepted that a degree of compromise was inevitable when a Labour government was in office during difficult economic times. Yet many felt frustrated that the Hawke government seemed inclined to implement changes in the financial sphere, often in line with views of conservative economists. End quote. Which led one Labour stalwart to note, quote, There has been in Australia a move towards the philosophy that whatever is spent on the poor causes a deficit, whatever is spent on the rich encourages investment. Indeed, this role of the various labour and socialist parties of the world in attacking their own is often the basis for a wider decline. Rank and file party activists often suffer demoralisation and confusion in its aftermath, as does the working class electorate, which as usual votes in good faith for such parties. This demoralisation is fertile ground for right-wing politics, 
It is noteworthy that in a host of countries where this has happened, the electorate has often returned a conservative government in the aftermath of a period of socialist rule. France, Spain, Australia, to name just three. Not surprisingly, the returned conservative alternative persists with policies that further attack the standard of living of the working class, a complete circle, as they say. The recent direction of economic policy in Ireland is a good example of one other tendency in parliamentary democracy. The people voted, but so what? In Ireland, the proportion of the GDP that is allocated to social spending has been declining since 1985. However, this policy has never actually been voted on by the electorate, despite a number of elections in this time span, since the public in Ireland and elsewhere cannot be persuaded to vote for such cutbacks, the various governments have instead resorted to what is called by The Economist, reform by stealth. In a survey entitled The Changing Face of the Welfare State, the same magazine speculates that this reform by stealth, quote, might yet transform the welfare state. Reform by stealth, it notes, has three distinct parts. Firstly, restrict claims by attaching conditions to benefits. Secondly, quote, provide universal basic welfare coverage, but redefine basic downwards. Thirdly, introduce means testing. In Ireland, despite numerous changes in the government, Fianna Fáil PD, Fianna Fáil Labour and Fine Gael Labour Democratic Left, this policy has been ongoing since 1985. It has been quite successful, the article notes, and has led to, quote, a nibble here and a nibble there. The result is an ever familiar picture. Poverty has risen as a percentage of the Irish population during the period under review, even though all the parties are committed to, quote, tackling poverty. In his well-known study of the democratic idea, C.B. Macpherson notes the changing fortunes of the idea of democracy among the elite of the world. It has been a rocky road. Quote, democracy used to be a bad word. Everyone who was anybody knew that democracy, in its original sense of rule by people, would be a bad thing, fatal to all the graces of civilised living. That was the position taken by pretty nearly all men of intelligence from the earliest time down to about 100 years ago. Then, within 50 years, democracy became a good thing. Its full acceptance into the ranks of respectability was apparent by the time of the First World War. Since then, in the last 50 years, democracy has remained a good thing. So much so, that everyone claims to have it. End quote. It could not be put more plainly. Parliamentary democracy is a good thing. In fact, it is one of the best things around, if you wish to preserve the current unequal order, as the rich do. It delivers the essential result every time we vote. The rich get richer, and the poor get poorer. Parliament or democracy? Throughout history, there has been an alternative idea of democracy. This is the idea of direct democracy. It surfaced during the Paris Commune in 1871. It surfaced in Russia during the early part of the revolution there. And it was put into large scale practice in Spain between 1936 and 37. It is the method often used by workers in a strike. It is the method that often arises spontaneously when people confront the state or the bosses. Direct democracy is the democracy that anarchists advocate. Direct democracy is different to parliamentary democracy in a number of important ways. 1. Direct democracy is about originating ideas as much as it is about approving them. In parliamentary democracy, people are never asked for their own ideas. They are only asked to approve or disapprove of ideas already prepared for them. Direct democracy is radically different in that way. Direct democracy is based on the realistic notion that people know best how to look after their own situation. We don't need specialists to tell us how to run our places of work or our communities. Anarchists argue that we are quite capable of doing this ourselves, 
All we need are the resources and the right to do this. Direct democracy is the method. 2. Direct democracy is based on delegation, not representation. The crucial difference between delegation and representation is that delegates are only elected to implement specific decisions. Delegates do not have the right, like TDs or MPs, to change a decision previously made by an assembly of people. Delegates, unlike representatives, can be immediately recalled and dismissed from their mandate if they don't carry out the specific function allotted to them. 3. Direct democracy is as much about the workplace as it is about the community. In parliamentary democracy, the workplace is immune to democracy, save what rights workers have won through their unions. In direct democracy, the operation of a factory or a plant or an office will be via a general assembly of all workers. This body will decide on conditions of work, will elect recallable managers and will organise how work is done. It will also elect people as delegates who will coordinate with the other places of work and with the broader community. Regional organisation will be managed through a federation of workplaces using a delegate structure. Could such a form of democracy work and what would it be like? As mentioned earlier, Spain provides one of the best examples of how far we can go in organising a new type of society. The collectives that were built by the workers of Spain between 1936 to 37 were highly democratic. They also showed the massive potential that we have if freed from the constraints of capitalism. It seems obvious, though it is impossible under capitalism, that we should all have a say over the work we do, how we do it, when and in what way. When we do have these rights, the quality and nature of our work changes enormously. And this is one of the things that was achieved in Spain. Democracy and work should always go together. And it is one of the singular failures of parliamentary democracy that this has never occurred. Nor is it ever likely to occur because of the threat it poses to capitalism and the rule of the boss. The Spanish Revolution began in 1936 and was strongly influenced by anarchist ideas. It was a large-scale revolution and was without any doubt the most extensive workers' revolution in the 20th century, especially to the extent that Spanish society was transformed. The Spanish Revolution was also particularly democratic. This was in part a reflection of the natural tendencies of popular revolutions, but it was also an expression of the wide influence of anarchist ideas which prioritised participation and mass assemblies in the struggle against Spanish capitalism. Anarchist ideas are founded around the principles of means and ends. We believe that the means we use will condition the ends we achieve. Anarchists want to build a free and democratic workers' society. As a result, anarchists use methods that will build this within the struggle for change. Partly as a result of anarchist activity, the workers' movement in Spain was strongly influenced by the practice of democracy. This was a deliberate goal. Anarchist methods of struggle set out to increase the self-activity and self-confidence of the working class. For this reason, anarchists oppose any involvement with the parliamentary road to socialism. Parliamentary activity and electioneering, in Spain as elsewhere, increases the passivity of workers and encourages people to believe that someone else will bring socialism. Anarchists fundamentally oppose this notion. We know, and history seems to vindicate the view, that the emancipation of the workers can only be carried out by the workers themselves. The methods used by anarchists in Spain were conscious and thought out. They are as relevant now as they were then. The main ones were as follows. Direct action was stressed as a means of resolving disputes with the government and the bosses. Anarchists pointed out that direct action is, firstly, very effective, since it often gets to the root of the problem. Secondly, it increases the confidence of those who struggle by showing them in practice the strength that they have as a collective body. Workplace assemblies 
with the principal method for decision-making in anarchist unions. Anarchists point out that workers are most powerful at their place of work. This is where we must organise. And this is where we must always attempt to implement democracy, not with the bosses, but against them. Anarchists used delegation, not representation, as a means of getting things done. Anarchists obviously recognised that a mass assembly of people is an unwieldy body for doing a lot of tasks. In a democracy, it is natural that we will appoint people to do certain things. This is a vital division of labour that must be used. But this appointment should be on the basis of delegation, not representation. Delegates, unlike representatives, are subject to recall. If they don't do what they were asked to do by the assembly, they can be relieved of their mandate and their actions reversed. This idea of delegation keeps the power of decision making at the level of the mass assembly. Anti-parliamentarianism Anarchists actively campaigned against using the Spanish parliament. They argued that the various socialist and communist parties in Spain would not bring about real change. Anarchists emphasised that only the workers themselves could do this. Anarchists refused to participate in the Spanish parliamentary process because they believed it would divert or even compromise the revolutionary objective. Anti-parliamentarianism was a major part of the democracy movement in Spain. The anarchist strategy of direct action and direct democracy in Spain was concretized by the formation of the syndicalist CNT union in 1910. Syndicalism was an attempt to provide a link between the broader anarchist movement and the workers on the shop floor. Its basic ideas revolved around all the workers being in one big union. All the employees in a workplace could join. They would link up with those in other jobs in the same area, and an area federation would be formed. Delegates from these would go forward to regional federations, who were then united into a national federation. All the delegates of the CNT were elected and recallable. They were given a clear mandate, and if they broke it, they could be replaced with new delegates. Every effort was made to prevent the growth of a bureaucracy of unaccountable full-time officials. There was only one full-time official in all of the CNT. Union work was done during working hours where possible, otherwise after work. This ensured that the officials of the union stayed in contact with the shop floor. The CNT experienced rapid growth from the time of its formation. By the outbreak of the Civil War in 1936, it had almost 2 million members. Its strongholds were in Catalonia and in Andalusia. It also had large followings in Galicia, Asturias, Levant, Zaragoza and Madrid. Its main strength was among textile, building and woodworkers as well as amongst agricultural labourers. As a preached social revolution, it was subject to vicious repression not only under the semi-dictatorship which ruled in Spain until 1931, but also the reforming governments which followed. The Popular Front government in particular, with its social democratic and Stalinist supporters, showed no mercy to the anarchist movement. The revolution that overtook Spain in July 1936 occurred initially as a response to the attempted coup by the military led by General Franco. The response to the coup in Catalonia and Aragon and in many other places where the anarchists were strong was the fruition of years of direct action and direct democracy in the Spanish workers' movement. Immediately, the popular movement that had resisted the fascists moved beyond the notion of restoring parliamentary democracy and began to implement a new democratic society. On the land. Collectivization of the land was extensive. Close on two thirds of all land in the Republican zone, that area controlled by the anti fascist forces, was taken over. In all, between five and seven million peasants were involved. The major areas were Aragon, where there were 450 collectives, the Levant, the area around Valencia, with 900 collectives, and Castile the area surrounding Madrid, with 300 collectives. Not only was the land collectivised, but in the villages, workshops were set up where the local tradespeople could produce tools, 
furniture, etc. Bakers, butchers, barbers, and so on also decided to collectivise. Collectivisation was voluntary and thus quite different from the forced collectivisation presided over by Stalin in Russia. Usually a meeting was called in the village. Most collectives were centred on a particular village and all present would agree to pool together whatever land, tools and animals they had. This pool would be added to whatever had already been taken from the big landowners. The land was divided into rational units and groups of workers were assigned to work them. Each group had its delegate who represented their views at meetings of the collective. A management committee was also elected and was responsible for the overall running of the collective. They would look after the buying of materials, exchanges with other areas, distributing the produce and necessary public works such as the building of schools. Each collective had regular general meetings of all its participants. If you didn't want to join the collective, you were given some land but only as much as you could work yourself. You were not allowed to employ workers. Production was changed by the revolution, but so was distribution. This was altered so as to be on the basis of what people needed. In many areas, money was abolished. People came to the collective store, often churches which had been turned into warehouses, and got what was available. If there were shortages, rationing was introduced to ensure that everyone got their fair share. But it was usually the case that production increased under the new system, thereby eliminating shortages. In agricultural terms, the revolution occurred at a good time. Harvests that would normally have been sold off to make big profits for a few landowners were instead distributed to those in need. Doctors, bakers, barbers, etc. were given what they needed in return for their services. Where money was not abolished, a family wage was introduced so that payment was on the basis of need and not the number of hours worked. Production increased greatly. Technicians and agronomists helped the peasants to make better use of the land. Modern scientific methods were introduced and in some areas yields increased by as much as 50%. There was enough to feed the collectivists and the militias in their areas. Often there was enough for exchange with other collectives in the cities for machinery. In addition, food was handed over to the supply committees who looked after distribution in the urban areas. Federations of collectives were established, the most successful being in Aragon. In June 1937, a plenum of regional federations of peasants was held. Its aim was the formation of a national federation, quote, for the coordination and extension of the collectivist movement, and also to ensure an equitable distribution of the produce of the land, not only between the collectives, but for the whole country, end quote. Unfortunately, Many collectives were smashed, not by Franco's army, but by the soldiers of the Stalinist General Lister before this could be done. The collectivists were not only concerned with their material well-being, they had a deep commitment to education and as a result of their efforts many children received an education for the first time. This was not the usual schooling either. The methods of Francisco Ferrer, the world-famous anarchist educationalist, were employed. Children were given basic literacy skills, and after that, inquisitive skills were encouraged. Old people were also looked after, and where necessary, special homes for them were built. Refugees from the fascist-controlled areas were looked after too. In the city In industry, the situation was a little different. The collectivisation was not as extensive in urban areas, but it still occurred on a huge scale. In Barcelona, over 3,000 enterprises were collectivised. All the public services, not only in Catalonia, but throughout the Republican zone, were taken over and run by committees of workers. To give some idea of the extent of the collectivisation, here is a list provided by one observer. He says, quote, Railways, train cars and buses, taxi cabs and shipping, electric light and power companies, gas works and water works, engineering and automobile assembly plants, mines and cement works, textile mills and paper factories, electrical and chemical concerns, glass bottle factories and perfumeries, food processing plants and breweries were confiscated and controlled by the workmen's sick committees. (laughs) 
either term possessing for the owners almost equal significance. Motion picture theatres and legitimate theatres, newspapers and printing, shops, department stores and hotels, deluxe restaurants and bars were likewise sequestered. End quote. Often the workplaces were seized because the owners had fled or had stopped production to sabotage the revolution. But the workers did not stop with these workplaces. All major places of work were taken over. Some were run and controlled by the workers. In others, control committees were established to ensure that production was maintained. These existed to exercise a power of veto on the decisions of the boss in cases where the workers had not taken over the actual power of management. In each workplace, an assembly of all the workers was the basic unit. Within the factory, workers would elect delegates to represent them on day-to-day -day issues. Anything of overall importance had to go to the assembly. This would elect a committee of between 5 and 15 workers, which would elect a manager to oversee the day-to-day -day running of the workplace. Within each industry, there was an industrial council, which had representatives of the two main unions, the CNT and UGT, and representatives from the committees. Technicians were also on these committees to provide technical advice. The job of the industrial council was to set out an overall plan for the industry. The Barcelona trams are a good example of what workers achieved when they took over. Out of the 7,000 workers on the tramways at the time of the revolution, some 6,500 were members of the CNT. Because of the street battles, all transport had been brought to a halt. The transport syndicate, as unions of the CNT were known, appointed a commission of seven to occupy the administrative offices while others inspected the tracks and drew up a plan of repair work that needed to be done. Five days after the fighting stopped, 700 tram cars, instead of the usual 600, all painted in the black and red colours of the CNT, were operating on the streets of Barcelona. With the profit motive gone, safety became more important and the number of accidents was reduced. Fares were lowered and services improved. In 1936, over 183 million passengers were carried. By 1937, this had gone up to over 233 million. The trams were running so efficiently that the workers were able to give money to other sections of urban transport. Wages were equalised for all workers and increased over the previous rates. For the first time, free medical care was provided for the workforce. Extensive reorganisation took place to make industry more efficient. Many uneconomic small plants, which were usually unhealthy, were closed down and production was concentrated in those plants with the best equipment. In 1937, the central government admitted that the war industry of Catalonia produced 10 times more than the rest of Spanish industry put together, and that this output could have been quadrupled if Catalonia had the access to the necessary means of purchasing raw materials. As with the examples of rural collectivization, distribution was also changed. Many parasitic middlemen were cut out of distribution. The wholesale business in fish and eggs was taken over as were the principal fruit and vegetable markets. The milk trade in Barcelona was collectivised, which saw over 70 unhygienic pasteurising plants closed down. Elsewhere, supply committees were set up. All of this made the middle classes very unhappy. To them, with their notions of becoming bigger bosses, the revolution was a step backwards. Equalisation funds were established to help out the poorer collectives. Indeed, there were many problems. Many markets were cut off in the fascist zone, and some foreign markets were also temporarily lost. Raw materials were often scarce, as sources of supply had been cut off. There was also the added problem that money was held back from the collectives by the central government for political reasons. This was one serious, though artificial, shortcoming of the collectivization, its lack of credit facilities which would have allowed investment and future planning. During the revolution, the banks had not been seized and the gold reserve already referred to stayed in the hands of the government. The CNT did hatch a plan to seize it, but backed down at the last moment.
Despite all this, production was increased and living standards for many working class people improved. In October 1936, the government was forced to recognise the collectivisation by passing a decree that recognised the fait accompli. It was also an attempt to control future collectivisation. This is only a very brief look at the collectivisation that happened. But in keeping with anarchist beliefs, the revolution did not stop there. For the first time in Spain, many workers had the benefit of a health service, organised by the CNT Federation of Health Workers. The federation consisted of 40,000 health workers, nurses, doctors, administrators and orderlies. Once again, the major success was in Catalonia, where it ensured that all of the 2.5 million inhabitants had adequate health care. Victims of the civil war were also treated. A programme of preventative medicine was also established based on local community health centres. At their 1937 congress, these workers developed a health plan for a future anarchist Spain, which could have been implemented if the revolution had been successful. The importance of the workers' collectors in Spain lie in the example that they provide. Elitist opinion since time immemorial has portrayed popular rule as an impossibility on the one hand or as a state of affairs that is likely to result in a shambles on the other. The workers of Spain showed this to be entirely false and showed this on a grand scale. Now as much as then, they offer us a concrete idea of how society can be organised by workers in a democratic and free way. This is a viable alternative. Despite the power of such an example, we are still faced with a difficult and tough struggle ahead. How to end the capitalist system with its greed, its misery and its competition. Now is as good a time as any to consider how we should conduct this struggle, what its aims should be and what methods we should use. We must aim for revolution and we must aim for real democracy. These are the essential goals, the points that we must reach before we can ever change anything. To do this, we argue as anarchists that we must build where we are actually strong, at work and in the community. Our methods must build on class solidarity, they must use direct action, they must aim to increase the self-activity of the workers and the poor, they must always encourage participation. About one thing we have no doubts. Parliament will not bring us the change that we need now. Parliament is a means of diffusing democracy, of channeling real struggles into a safe dead end. Time and time again it has become a graveyard for the workers' movement. That is a mistake we must not repeat again. That's been another Worker Solidarity Movement podcast. Thank you for listening. There's plenty more where that came from. If you like the sound of real change, of real democracy and real freedom, then make sure to click the link in the description and visit the WSM website at www.wsm.ie. Take care and see you next time. Remember, another world is possible.